All right, welcome back. So today, we're going to cover three kind of subtopics. The first one is going to be the superposition principle. And essentially, it's, it's waves that are interfering. And, and this has uh, some very, very uh, cool, more advanced topics. But let's just start it out, and it's really simple. If you have a wave that is traveling in one direction, and you have another wave that is traveling in the opposite direction, and they're going to hit each other, we can say this is the before state. And during their interference, when they interfere with each other, kind of drew that a little bit too drastically. Uh, maybe a little bit bigger, actually. There. So essentially, this is during interaction. Now we're going to give these guys amplitudes. Let's say this is an amplitude of 1 and this is 1. Then while they're interfering, this wave in the middle will have an amplitude of 2. This is called constructive interference. That means that they interfere with each other, adding to each other's amplitude. And you don't have to have this in this orientation alone. You could also have it where you have them inverted. So let's say, for example, you have this wave going to interfere with this wave. And then during their interaction, oops, messed that up. So now you have negative 1 and negative 1 adds up to negative 2. So this is also the same situation. In other words, doesn't the waves don't have to be upright. Now, um, if I show you what happens after the waves interfere, this is now after, what happens is we have the same waves, but they've now passed through each other, and they're going now in opposite directions. So this is before, during interaction or interference, and then afterwards. So they are unchanged after the interference. They are in the same state as they were before. Now the other type of interference is called destructive. And I think you know what that's going to look like. We have one wave that is coming in. That's, let's say, amplitude positive one. And we have another wave that is coming in that has an amplitude of negative one. And they're going to uh, meet each other in the middle. Now, in this case, during interference, we have no interaction or sorry, we have no amplitude, and this is called, so they, in other words, they cancel each other out, and this is called destructive interference. Now, again, once they pass through each other, they are unchanged. So we'll still have our negative one traveling in this direction, and we'll still have our positive one traveling, that's a plus, in this direction. Just to kind of let you know as to uh, like a real world application of this, if you ha have uh, ear canceling earphones, for your smartphone, uh, those guys use 
noise cancellation, which essentially what it does is it measures the ambient noise and it creates a signal which will destructively interfere with the ambient noise, canceling it out. And that's how it works. It works on this principle. But obviously it's a lot more complicated because it actually uses, it has to reconstruct a very complicated uh, wave and it does that using fast Fourier transforms. And that's well beyond the scope of this uh, course. However, if you want to find a very uh, cool video on fast Fourier transforms, I, I would recommend you go and watch the one made by Veritasium's channel. It's a really good one. OK, um, let's continue. So here is, I'm going to show you an example of this. This is uh, uh, an animation provided online from OPhysics website. And we're going to animate this. Now you're going to see that when those two waves so interfere, the, the sum of the waves, the sum of the pulses, the principle of superposition is shown below. And you can see that when they are on top of each other, they are, you can see it right there. I, I kind of stopped it too late. But they are interfering destructively. Let me play it again. You'll see that when they, at the exact moment that they are up at the same place, the sum goes to zero. And there you go. I paused it at the right point. So here is the example of constructive interference, where they are both upright and they're going to add to each other instead of canceling one another out. And you can see how that occurs in real time. And when they join up, their amplitudes add up. So our next uh, subtopic for this video is going to be Doppler shift. Now, Doppler shift is a really cool phenomena that they even use in weather prediction. And uh, it, is, it involves a source and an observer. OK, so in order to understand Doppler shift, what we need to do is we need to write down a person who is an observer. And we need to write down a source of waves. Now, if the velocity between the observer and the source, if the relative velocity between these two things is zero, okay. so in other words, the source puts out a specific frequency. Okay, We'll say that's f. Okay, And the observer will hear this frequency. And we'll say that the observer Here's also here's frequency f. So if, in other words, if relative velocity equals zero. In other words, what does that mean? It means that the observer is not moving towards or away from the source. And the source is not moving towards or away from the observer. In other words, the distance between them is constant. Okay? If d is constant, that means the relative velocity between them is zero. And in this case, the observer hears the exact frequency that the source is emitting. Okay, let's say this is an audio source, an audio wave. However, how does this change if there is a relative velocity? Well, 
you can have one of two situations. So if we do, if there is a relative velocity, let's say now that the observer is velocity is zero, but the source has a velocity the source has a velocity towards the observer okay so the source velocity is not zero in this case the observer will the, the observer's uh, uh, recorded or heard frequency will be greater than the frequency of the source in this case. Now let me show you why this happens. And if you're wondering why I drew these circles non-concentrically, you'll see in a second that it's because of the velocity of the source that the wave fronts are closer together on the side of the observer. So here is a simulation of this Doppler effect and you can see if I move my mouse here you can see that in this case the source is moving towards this observer on the right and as it's doing so the wave fronts are closer together as the source is moving towards the front observer. That means this front observer is his perceived frequency will be higher. Okay? And vice versa, notice the source is moving away, starting now, is moving away from this back observer. And also notice that the wave fronts are further apart. Okay, that means that the frequency is lower for the back observer. So this is like a, a simulation to show what's the cause of the Doppler effect. So how can we therefore write a statement? Now what we can say is that if the observer or the source are or both if the observer or the source or both are moving towards each other you could say are moving together probably better to say towards each other then the observed frequency will be higher. Okay? So also, the opposite of this is also true. If the observer or, or the source is moving, if they are moving away from each other, then let's write a statement describing this situation. So there it is. Notice here I have the observed frequency will be less than the source frequency. If the observer or the source or both are moving away from each other, then the observed frequency will be lower. Right? And the last point that I'd like to make about this is remember that the wave equation is velocity equals f times lambda. Now the velocity is the velocity of the wave. This is only dependent on the medium, so this is a constant value. That means that if we increase the frequency, the wavelength should get smaller. 
Oppositely, if we decrease the frequency, then the wavelength should get longer. Okay? So, just something to keep in mind as frequency and wavelength are inversely related to each other. Our next topic for today is going to be diffraction. And for this topic, uh, we are going to just simply define the concept of diffraction and it is the bending of waves around obstacles. So if we had, let's say, straight waves that are traveling in this direction and they encounter a obstacle like this where we have a bar this is these guys are barriers where the wave cannot pass through okay then when this straight wave encounters this opening it will actually pass through this opening but if you th if you're thinking that it's just going to pass through straight as it came in well it actually depends on the frequency. If the frequency is very high, this is what it's going to look like, what I've just drawn here. Now, obviously, if the frequency was very high, these wavelengths should be much closer together. So if the frequency was very high, we'd have lots and lots and lots and lots of waves close together and they would also be represented by lots and lots and lots of waves close together on the other side. This is for, so in, in, in essence, an example of this would be, for example, visible light. Visible light has an extremely short wavelength and it casts sharp shadows. And that's what you would expect in this case. The wave would not be able to bend around this obstacle. But let's not make this a short wavelength. Let's make it a long wavelength. And I'm just going to remove those lines to make the wavelengths longer. And in fact, in this case, we don't have sharp shadows, but instead we have the bending of the wave around obstacles. In other words, if we had an observer right here at this location, they would be able to detect the wave even though they were standing behind the barrier from which direction the wave is coming. This, is a, this can be uh, explained not in terms of visible light, but let's say for example the radio wave. Radio waves are very long wave, wavelengths, especially uh, AM waves are much longer, are longer than FM waves. And in that case, they're able to bend around an obstacle or barrier, like, for example, a building, and you're able to hear the radio station on your radio, even when the transmitter is on the other side of a barrier. It is because the waves are diffracting around obstacles. So let me show you an example of this. Uh, let me just write down one thing, right? So I'll say longer wavelengths have more, or I should say maybe produce more diffraction or have more diffraction. Another you know, synonym you could think of dis diffraction is more bending. So let's have a look at this simulation. So here we have an experiment from uh, a wave interference from uh, FET.Colorado.edu. And we're going to generate some waves, some straight waves here. And they're going to hit this barrier but there is an opening in the barrier and you can see very clearly that the waves are bending when they pass through the barrier opening and 
the waves are able to be detected even directly behind the barrier. We can even measure this. We could put uh, this measuring device here that is directly behind the barrier and you can see that there is in fact a wave there. So it's changing this straight wave into this circular wave and that is a result of the waves diffracting around or through the slit opening.